Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Cox. I'm a member of the NET Capital team. Let's allow one moment for people to settle in. Thanks. All righty, let's go ahead and dive in. Welcome again. Today, I'm excited to welcome in John Bauman and Marshall Kaplan with Launch Space Technologies. Uh, as always, this company is actively raising capital on the Net Capital platform. I'll go ahead and add a link to that into the chat here in Zoom. There we go. Um, you can go to netcapital.com and search Launch Space or go directly to netcapital.com slash companies slash Launch Space Technologies Corporation. And that, again, I've added a link to that in the chat. Uh, a few quick housekeeping items. Please do use the Q&A feature built into Zoom. Um, I know there's also a chat feature, but Q&A makes it so much easier to track all the questions as they come in. And I do want to get to as many of them as possible. And please do ask your questions. That's what we're here for. We really do want to keep this as interactive as possible. So I look forward to your thoughtful questions for the Launch Space team. With all that being said, please join me in welcoming Launch Space to the stage. Come on in, John. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what you're building with Launch Space Technologies? Uh, am I live now? You are. Okay, let's go. So thanks, guys, for considering us. Whether you've invested already, thank you, or you're considering, again, thank you. And um, tell you a little about what we're trying to do. Um, and I have some notes, not because I don't know my company, but I, it's so much. I could talk for hours, so I better be focused, especially with Eric. He smiles. I go off topic. Uh, <laughs> we get along too well. I said that in the text. It, it's not, it's, it's counterproductive. So what we try to do is it's space flight safety. And uh, if you saw the logo on our offering portal, it's uh, the global space economy is growing to a trillion dollars in the next five years is the forecast from the Department of uh, Commerce. And uh, it's all at risk due to orbital debris, due to military threats, due to space traffic management. There's billions of things up there and we can't manage it all. So what we're trying to do is provide space flight safety for astronauts, active satellites, the International Space Station, future space stations, because they're gonna do that. And the military satellites that protect the US from being attacked and that, if you've read it all and you're interested in space, you know the next war is probably going to be in space. Uh, the, the, in the last two years, the military has shifted that the next war will, if there's a war, it'll be in space. Now they're saying the next war will be in space. That's because they think that if you, if you blow a country's satellites uh, out of orbit, that's not the same thing as killing people so they can get away with it. So that's really what we're doing. Uh, through a variety of methods, which we're going to go through in a lot of detail, I'm sure. This team has literally decades of experience. We'll get to that uh, in, in a specific question, it looks like. But in building and designing launch vehicles, in uh, space systems, satellites, working with NASA, working for NASA, uh, and in national security space, they call it working at the, the Air Force, it was called now, it's the Space Force, Space Command. Um, there are a lot of pressing problems, and we're going to also have to get into the revenue model in detail, but from a high level, it's going to be a combination of fixed price contracts from the government. It could be market price from commercial companies, or it could be subscription revenue streams, uh, such as for clearing orbital debris on a uh, recurring basis. So there, there's a number of revenue streams, and this is basically to pr protect low Earth orbit, geosynchronous Earth orbit. And then in between geosynchronous Earth orbit and the moon, it's called the cislunar space. And then where the bad guys like to hide sometimes is on the far side of the moon till they decide to want to come out on what's called Lagrange points 
these stable points and they hang out until they think there's an opportunity to come back at us when we're blind. So it's getting really scary up there. And um, that's, that's what we're gonna try to do in a variety of ways. You know, it sounds like a lot for a small company, but we've already got credentials and milestones to back this up. Yeah. Uh, I think that's yeah. pretty good for the first one. You got I, more, oh, yeah, that's, I think that's great, John. That's great for the first one. Yeah, so well, let's, let's do a deep dive into the team now. So uh, tell All us right. a little bit about you, know, you and your background as well as you would love to welcome Marshall on to share about his background and we could talk about the rest of the team as well. Well, we'll go to the team, yeah. You know what, there's a thing with Columbo, I'm getting older, right? So we'd say just one more thing, right? So I have some, some cram note points so there are a lot of guys you say, oh, there's a lot of companies, and I'll, I'll do it in the summary. Orbital debris, why are you the one? Or looking at stuff in space, because no, no one else is comprehensive. And by the way, the net captain team has been very good at beating me into submission about not making promissory comments. We will, or you're the only one, but we have the only comprehensive solution because there are people up there trying to solve orbital debris remediation, and there are people trying to look at space, but no one's doing both. And you really need both to solve the problem, which I'll give a sports demo later to show you why, if you can't see what's coming at you, you can't, the tennis ball is coming at your face at hundred miles an hour, you don't see it. I don't care who you are, you're not gonna hit it. So I, th I think people have missed the problem and it's really Marshall's idea and architecture that solved the problem. Okay, now, and you would think that all these things, we expect to be able to save the government billions of dollars a year and maintain space superiority amongst other things. It's pretty critical right now. Okay, now I'm ready for team. I jump back. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. That's, that's great. Let's yeah. So, yeah. so, so who, yeah, tell, tell us about yourself, John. I'm a serial entrepreneur. <clears throat> I've done seven or eight different technologies and companies, and it's been very broad. I was at IBM Microelectronics. Uh, I thought after graduate school, the space industry looked kind of dead. I, I kept seeing the shuttle going up every other month, and it became a little bit of a like, okay, what's next? So I went to work for IBM Microelectronics, did my first startup after that. Then I uh, had a great idea there. I really had an idea past IBM. I went to IBM with my, my, I went to IBM with my first startup in mind, but I needed to partner with them and learn some things. So I really was there for a year prepping for my first startup. It was part of my five-year plan of more education and we'll go work for someone like IBM. And I did that for a startup and it was, it was reasonably successful, not as the whole market changed. But then I had an idea. I went to work for Lucent Bell Labs and I managed this incredible P&L. And we got to, I think it was $40 million of revenue um, in the first year uh, with this new launch. And then I did another startup and then I went into video on demand. It was one, with the second coming to the world. So I'm going too detail. A lot of different technologies, all cutting edge, always Always, there's never been anything I've done where we weren't the first or second in the world to actually do something. And that's what made it exciting. We were always number one or number two. I don't mean a market size, but I mean to even do it. And that's that race, I haven't stopped since. The first one, my first startup was 1997, but I was prepping for it since 1993. And I knew it would take that long of a burn. So that's the passion and hasn't diminished in you know, 27 years, even a little. All right, so now with launch space, that's it. I hooked up with Marshall. He made the biggest mistake of his life when I met him and he asked me to be his business partner. And he'll, if you did a pan in now, his face will groan. He asked me, I didn't ask him. He had this brilliant idea. And I said, this sounds great, let's go do it. And that, that's me. It, you know, uh, you wanna put Marshall on? But that'll be yeah. one. his bullet yeah, point. I mean, oh, put the teams, but you'll put the team up after Marshall, that little team slide I gave you. That sounds good. That's, that's great. Thanks, John. Yeah, I've uh, <clears throat> been in the space industry most of my career. I was a professor at Penn State Aerospace Engineering. And after that, I went into a consulting industry and spent a lot of years working with uh, national security space, uh, commercial space. I was chief engineer in two launch vehicle programs. And I've helped a lot on a lot of the space programs and helped a lot of the technology. We now fly in orbit, so uh, I'm quite familiar with uh, space. And also, I had one of the early uh, study grants from NASA to study space debris. So I've been looking at this problem for a long time. And finally, we came up with some very good solutions. We have patents. And so we feel very, uh, very strong about our intellectual properties and uh, 
our trade secrets, so to speak. So we're. <clears throat> Uh, Eric, can you put up the team slide now, please? However, you Absolutely. whether it's from the PowerPoint, there you go. So Marshall was uncharacteristically humble, and uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, when Elon Musk decided it's public now that he needed to land his reusable vehicle on the water, um, and Jeff Bezos, his Blue Origin, held the pan. He called up Marshall, he knew personally, and said, "We got to do this. What am I going to do?" Marshall wrote a 135-page paper to the patent office saying it's prior art and the patent got thrown out and they didn't contest it. And he didn't do one of the early studies in orbital debris. He thought of it and it was the first study. And when Skylab was gonna crash into, into the ocean or, or North America, no one knew where. And NASA was uh, laid on the shuttle. They called him up and said, what are we gonna do? And he was written up around the world for coming up with the technique that NASA used to safely deorbit Skylab when three out of the two, one out of the three gyros worked. It got the thing spinning uh, in an eccentric fashion. I'm not describing it well. And it safely crashed in the ocean and on and on and on. It spent nine years in the national security space, which at that point you had top secret clearance. So you can't talk about it, but you've been around the block and I'm lucky you're my business partner. Thank you. So I let's go. John, I must also mention we have had an opportunity to brief uh, several uh, government officials about our ideas, including the head of Space Command, uh, uh, Space Force, and also the head of NASA. So they all are familiar with our ideas and they all really like them. And you're much more uh, focused than I am. Head of NASA, Jim Bridenstine, the Deputy Administrator of Mar uh, NASA, Jim uh, Moorhard, the, uh, the, these are the immediate past, the Chief Technology uh, Officer of NASA, uh, head, head of a division of NASA, um, all over the place with NASA. Um, the only NASA Space Act agreement in the world for orbital debris with NASA Glenn. Uh, it was General Hyten for Space Command. I'm sorry, General Hyten, who's the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, makes him the number two uh, uniform officer in the United States. And if uh, the number one who's doing all these uh, uh, Senate hearings, gets knocked out, then he'll be number one. So um, on and on and on. Uh, the associate director of the FAA, White House meetings. Let me not go because this will be two hours, not one hour. So let's go back to the, um, the picture. Maybe you could just put it blank. No more, no, no more people up there, Eric, and just the team slide for the moment. Um, so Congressman Bob Walker, if you go to our offering page, he's the leading lobbyist in the space industry. Um, Many, if not all of the past presidents have used him as an advisor. Uh, I won't get into politics, but I know that he wrote tre President Trump's uh, policy for, for space. So help, you know, who, who are the picks for the top offices? What are we doing with Space Force? Uh, how are we gonna have space superiority? Uh, he's helped us get into NASA, military, FAA. I can go on and on and on, White House meetings. It's, it's been incredible. He's been a mentor. When I met him, I said, I, I hope this relationship is mentoring. He goes, if you listen to me, it will be. So much so now that, that he's on our board. I don't know how many companies, but I don't think he's, it's less than what you can count in one hand in a 45 year uh, career that he's been on the board of a company. And he thought enough of us, which we appreciate. Let's go to GP Sandu. Uh, December 6th, I'm going to have to take him down. He's been an advisor, but in case something came up, he has not taken a penny, and that's important. He didn't want to. So GP was the head of all spacecraft. Uh, he was the superintendent of all spacecraft programs for the Naval Research Lab, and they're world-renowned. The ground station they use is used by all the military for the space programs. He's put a lot of satellites up there. Uh, he, did, he did announce in an email he's on December 6th going to become the deputy director of IARPA, which is the intelligence community's equivalent of DARPA. It's a very seriously big deal. So he's been an informal advisor. And by doing that, he, and he had permission from the government to do that. He, uh, he's right now at the Naval, uh, the Naval Academy, and that'll end on December 6th. So he got permission to at least guide us and give us some input but never been a part of contractual meetings or any of that, because that, you know, you, you don't want to have that kind of uh, involvement. 
Chris Rollins is at Research Support Instruments, kind of in an unassuming office park, yet they're involved with NASA programs, all the GOES weather satellites that are determining our weather, where the, the, the uh, sensor suite was designed by his team, uh, the, the NRO, uh, National Reconnaissance Office, NRL. He's been involved in a ton of civil and uh, military programs, uh, many of them top secret. Bob Sanker, uh, this is hilarious. He was Marshall's first graduate student at Penn State, and he has been involved in, for 35 years in designing satellite buses and the architecture behind that. You know, if you, if you don't know the space industry, a bus is sort of the satellite and the payload is what gets integrated into it, such as an optical telescope to look at what's going on out there. Uh, and he was also a shuttle astronaut. Rich Calarco. Um, and Dennis, because I'm, I'm going long, um, complementary backgrounds, they know each other well, both involved uh, at Space Command at one point, both top secret uh, clearance. I don't think Rich does anymore, but Dennis definitely does. Um, we expect the CIS Lunar project to go first, and Dennis is the project manager on that one, and Rich has got, um, is going to be the one handling what's in low Earth orbit and geostationary Earth orbit. And you're gonna basically have, without going into architectural detail, some sensors looking up all the way from the low earth orbit, looking at debris, looking at geostationary, geosynchronous earth orbit, and it's this lunar space. And they're gonna be some in deep space looking down at the earth, and looking up and down, you have a complete solution and they have incredible backgrounds. Um, it's not ramping up to 31 team members. There are 31 team members that I, I have in my business plan allocated um, already. And some of these names are not on that list. So it would be more like 35. And if I add two more people for orbit debris, it's 36 or 37. This funding gets us part way into that. When I sign a hopeful contract uh, with Space Command, then it ramps up very quickly. And I just lost my laptop. How do you like that? So now I don't have my notes anymore. How do you like that? That's not well, well, you're, <laughs> well, you're, well, you're doing all right. And while you're, while you're getting that ready, I'm going to go ahead and take, uh, remove the screen here. That is a phenomenal team that you've been able to assemble there. Um, uh, do we want to give Marshall a chance to add anything while you're getting that, while you're looking for that, John, or can we continue on to the problem? Let's continue. I, I better know my own stuff, but I will reboot because you can see how long, right. I, you know, when I started this, I figured I'd be 15 minutes and now, now that I'm rambling. That's why I have notes, not because I don't know my stuff, but to keep it from <laughs> going on and on. No problem, no problem. Well, well, this is something that maybe maybe I'll let uh, Marshall start for a moment. We can talk about what is the problem that Launch Space is solving here with regards to orbital debris and exit and other other pieces of the project. Go for it. Okay, sure, sure. That's uh, that's fine. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, the fundamental problem is this: uh, we're putting out more and more traffic in terms of satellites, and each satellite generates a certain amount of debris. That debris multiplies as, as other debris hits it and so on. So this has been going on for about 60 some years now. We've reached a point now where satellites are getting hit more often by debris and, the, and we're actually at a point now where insurance companies will not uh, insure a satellite that has been hit by a piece of debris. So the debris problem is getting more serious. You've probably uh, read this in the literature. There've been articles almost every day about this. Uh, we are quickly approaching because of the number of launches we're quickly approaching that point in which we have to do something. Uh, we're putting up an additional 50 to 100,000 satellites over the next few years, in addition to what was there already, all in low orbits. This, and low orbits are highly congested. It turns out most people don't understand this, but when you cross the polar region with these satellites, it's a traffic jam. It's a total traffic jam. And frankly, um, I think we're about to see a point at which it starts getting a lot worse in terms of collisions. So we're positioning ourselves basically to be able to guarantee uh, space safety and also the sustainability of the space environment by both um, uh, tracking satellites, tracking uh, debris, and also removing small debris, as well as uh, providing data to satellite operators so that they will know when they have to move the satellites in case of a collision. So all these services are not really available yet because our capabilities on the ground are not good enough. So we're going to have a space-based tracking system plus a space-based collection system to take care of the debris. Okay. 
No, that's great. That's great. And actually, a question came in from the uh, from the audience here that I think is like kind of a, a got a perfect timing to bring in now here. Are there real world examples of space or satellite catastrophes that have already taken place? Go for it, Marshall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There have been several. Uh, the most famous one probably is the uh, Iridium Cosmos collision in 2000, I think it's 2009, where two satellites actually collided and created 25% more debris than what was in the orbit before in a single collision. So, and there are a couple, there have been a couple of others, but yeah, we have some real good uh, examples. In fact, we have some simulations that may have that showing the debris issue as the two collide and separate and, and cause a multiplication of the debris field. So it's pretty dramatic. And this is uh, an early activity. It's going to get a lot worse. And so that's why we're anxious to get this thing going. We do want to position ourselves to guarantee space safety. Uh, if we don't, then we may have we may lose access to space in another few years. So we're, our timing is perfect and we're ready to go. We have the technology. So if we uh, get the funding, we'll be on our way. Let me jump in if I could, Eric. Sounds good. I just can't tell how much because I just see me. I don't know if I'm fully on. So there was really, there have been other things that aren't so published, but it, the major one is Iridium and, and the Cosmos. It's part of our video, which I'd like to show a little towards the end. I have an interesting clip of that, which is on our portal offering if we don't get to it. Um, but there was a second one a couple of months ago. So we flew since 1957, we had one that was really well publicized and that was the major one. And only a couple months ago, there was one between, uh, I don't know if it was a Russian spacecraft and a Chinese spacecraft, or it might've been some debris from a Russian um, uh, launch vehicle that, that hit uh, a, a uh, satellite from China. But that was the second one that was well published well publicized so there haven't been a lot of collisions which is sort of where we're, we're going to go a little further from big stuff into our presentation but there are three real problems uh that we're trying to solve which is again the big one is overall space flight safety for astronauts space stations active satellites our military satellites space superiority so it's space flight safety and the, and the result of, of what could happen, or debris and other collision threats uh, or attack would be threatening the global space economy. So there's three things that cause that problem. One is orbital debris, which ranges from the danger from about down to a millimeter up to small school bus sized pieces of debris. The second one, space traffic management, which I mentioned, which are the 100,000 satellites that are gonna be put up in, in low earth orbit, the more than that cube sats, which, which can range from 10 centimeters uh, as a cube or to three U, there's gonna be more than 100,000. It's easy to put little things up than the big expensive things. Uh, so that's a space traffic nightmare, okay? Uh, it's, like, it's like in your mind, imagine like a field of locusts and where do you, what do you do, where do you go? And um, military threat, so those are the three problems that threaten space flight safety and the global space economy. And there's two ways to solve that. Um, really, if you want to, if you could put up that picture, normally it, it's in my deck, which may look better. And I, I have it side by side on yours, it's vertical, but maybe you want to, whether you go to the deck for that picture or you go to the little notes I gave you, just let's put the picture up, please. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll go from the deck, which, which, uh, which page? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. It's the one that has that, that picture. So it would be probably best would be four. Four? Okay, no problem. One second. Yeah, I'm multitasking an awful lot. No problem. Here we are. Hey, up, up, up. There you go. That's not the best image of each, but at least it's in one spot. So <laughs> there's sort of two things we're doing. The, the first one is the, and Marshall can espouse this better than I can, but from a high level, if you don't see the problem, you can't, you can't respond to the problem. The Iridium and Cosmos collision, which I'll show in a video shortly, happened because the data wasn't accurate enough. So uh, Iridium, the Iridium satellite, which is a US <clears throat> satellite constellation, they made a maneuver. When they got data, there was gonna be a, a potential collision from a, Rus a dead Russian spacecraft. Had they held their course, they wouldn't have hit it but the data wasn't accurate enough. They got nervous, they tried to maneuver out of the way and boom, they hit. So the data 
you don't see what's going on there well enough. And there's a tremendous big data gap between one millimeter and two centimeters. That data gap, we believe there's up to a trillion pieces that, that's gonna be up there in the next five years. What NASA posts on their site, it, it, I was gonna make a judgment and I should, but I won't because you know this is recorded. They're posting data on their site like it's new that comes from 1997. If you compare what you could see on Google to what they claimed in 1997 with their three-tiered shard of orbital debris, versus what's on their orbital debris ordum, and they, they are quoting 100 million pieces, but it's the same 1997 data. And we, <laughs> we're, we're, we're ramping up to 100,000 satellites, the collisions, there's a lot going on up there. So do you believe in 24 uh, years, we have the same amount of, of, uh, of debris and problem that we did 24 years ago? You know, I, so um, we're blind, and they don't know because they can't see that small. Um, the smallest anyone claims is two centimeters, but that's not what's what called constant custody. It's like a, you're sitting looking out your window on a beautiful day and a bird flies by. That window's your field of view. You have an idea for an instant where the bird's coming from and where it's going, but you're not tracking that bird as it's going all around the world. That's sort of what they've got. Every time something's looking up on a telescope, is, is it a beautiful day from the ground or radar? Is it sunny out or is it cloudy out? Is it daytime or nighttime? Um, you know, is it raining? What, what's going on? So that's, there's so many things that's ground-based for geo radar. They don't have constant custody. So they, they see things coming in, but down to really with constant custody, our guess is it's more like five centimeters. There's a definitely a data gap between a millimeter that could still damage or destroy things to two centimeters, more likely five. You have to close that data gap or you, you're gonna lose satellites increasingly, threats to space stations, threats to astronauts. Um, and, you know, uh, you start getting up to the CubeSat size, a swarm of those can attack uh, military satellites or bigger ones coming back from, from the moon or elsewhere. So you gotta see better. If someone belts a ball at your face in a tennis game and you don't see it, you're gonna get hit. Um, with better data, you no longer need to be clearing big debris the same way. Everyone's like, oh, got to clear that dead satellite. No, if you see well, if a bus is coming at you, even though it's fast and you see it, what do you do? You get out of its way. So when you have a satellite in space and you have good data on where that small piece of debris, the big is coming your way, you do what's called a Delta V, a small little burn. You ever so slightly, a couple of meters per second, slow down in your orbit and it passes in front of you. If it's coming up in a different direction, you ever so slightly speed up temporarily and it passes behind you. Or you hold your course and do nothing. I'm a big sailor when I get time. Sometimes in a race, boat's gonna cross you. You wanna beat them. It's gonna cross in front of you, behind you, or do you hold your course? You wanna minimize the risk. So seeing is important. We don't see well enough. Then what you're seeing is, an, is a depiction in the earth of what our final orbital debris remediation pad will be. It's gonna collect all debris from two centimeters and smaller. Whatever, where, where we, so that is designed to capture debris and not have a splatter from the impact to create more debris. I, I see things in Japan, they're, harpooning stuff well we got it makes me think like they're they're going back to their illegal whale hunting expeditions did i just say that i mean harpooning it you should have heard nasa's comments in closed meetings like what are they doing so um we're going to capture debris we're working with nasa they're helping us create materials for our patented solution so that we can capture debris but not create this big splat when there's a big impact and so the, our strategy is see everything we can see with constant custody, avoid the big stuff and capture the small stuff. If you can maneuver out of the way of the big stuff, you don't have to spend tens of billions of dollars chasing, chasing 30,000 pieces of debris, just a few that might be a collision risk. And that's a much more elegant, simple and cheaper solution. And again, on and on, you care about money, your investors, but you want to know that we're not fools and we know what we're doing. 
And, you know, we've got milestones towards all these things that we're doing. You know, no one else is going on the ISS with their debris solution. No one else has a space act agreement with NASA for their orbital debris solution. Um, no one has a partner like Airbus that's put in an in-kind contribution of over $5 million towards our ISS project. So that's the credentials and debris. And the Air Force Research Lab, we had a funded study where we said we can see things better that are risks to military satellites. And we're paid to, to prove that. And the next step is hopefully getting some sensors by a, a government uh, furnished equipment, which means we don't pay for it. It's just a joint mission, a public-private partnership to go put the first demonstrator up there to look for these things. And that's sort of what we're doing. And I, I better move along again. Yeah, that's, let me why go why you, that's why you pull Marshall in to cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll go ahead and pause there for a moment, but that was a great description of the problem and the solution. Uh, we're about halfway through scheduled programming at this point. So I'd love to remind folks that as always, uh, Launch Space is actively raising capital on the Net Capital platform. You can go to netcapital.com and search Launch Space or you can go directly to this link that I'm re-adding into the chat function right now, uh, or you can go directly to netcapital.com slash companies slash launch space technologies corporation. Um, there, there are more questions coming in and, and you, were, you were actually touching on it towards the end there. Uh, do you currently have any current or pending contracts with NASA or any notable private companies, example, SpaceX or Starlink? There's one private company that I can't, it's under NDA, but they're a space platform uh, that we were looking to potentially use to take us to the equator. It's complicated. It's, you use up a lot of energy to go, let's say, from Kennedy Space Center and do what's called a plane change. You lose 70% of your efficiency. Uh, I'm, I'm not using scientific terms on purpose because I don't know who's on the call. But getting the equator means you lose 70% as a payload penalty of your effectiveness of that launch vehicle getting to the equator. So there are launch vehicle companies. Maybe Virgin is one of them that has small but that want to go, that have, you know, platforms where they take you up on a plane, for example, and I'm not being specific, and they do a launch from there, but they can fly to the equator and do it. So early stage entrepreneurs, actually Marshall's idea is that, you know, you need a customer and we could use some, some money to close our funding gap this first year. So uh, why don't you give us a half a million dollars to be your customer? And see, you look to me, I was surprised. He just said, well, that's a good idea. <laughs> it's not, it wasn't that easy to close the contract, but conceptually he got it. Um, so we, we basically were paid to do an engineering study to be their customer and do all the documentation for anybody that came after us. Um, I, I just, I can't talk about it too much. I, really, I have an NDA. I could talk very generally. Um, with NASA, we have the only Space Act agreement. Now, this is where it gets a little funky. I, I didn't even understand it fully. There's a company called CASIS, the, the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, C-A-S-I-S. -S. Let me give you their whole spiel. It, it makes your head spin. CASIS, comma, manager of the ISS, in the National Space Station, National Lab, comma, under cooperative agreement with NASA. What that really means is they gave us a grant and ultimately they're gonna take over what, what Airbus is paying for. And they're gonna take a lot of that over because NASA gives them a budget every year to put things on the ISS, but they don't generally give out grants. They gave us a grant towards payments uh, for Airbus, our implementation partner. And um, we had to pitch NASA on our idea and we pitched them and we two steps of proposal. So I don't wanna say NASA approved it, but it's, it's de facto, funded by NASA, I think completely. And um, so uh, money for our ISS project, ultimately contributing to putting us up on the space station and bringing us back after a year so we can examine what was put up there and how it handled the orbital debris impacts um, and a NASA Space Act agreement with NASA Glenn Research Center. So that's serious involvement with NASA and Airbus, which is, I'll tell you what, if you wanna invest, they're gonna be, starting tonight, very serious press releases that we had approved that the president of Airbus US that handles space group, long, long to our press release towards helping us. She knows we wanna raise money, but we can't say Airbus and raise money. They, they poo poo that. That's a separate uh, press release that's going out to all the newswires tonight. 
And then there'll be a second press release Thursday or Friday, which is a net capital press release, which is also going out to all the newswires. All the pub major newspapers will hopefully get picked up. And that's one saying we're raising money on this platform. So um, I'm not trying to do a cheap plug, but I know I won't say who. There was one other company that did something like this, but not to this extent. You know who it is, Eric, but let's not say. They did this, and in a week, they sold their million-dollar raise out. I've been too busy running the company to think of this, but we're doing the – just just saying, I'm not exaggerating. You'll see press releases if you Google starting probably tomorrow on what we're doing in a big way. So a couple, um, a couple of exciting players in the space working with you, bringing us back to that question that came through. Um, I do want to keep us along here because we only have about 20 minutes left here. So all right. um, we're, I still want to cover market, business model, and then some progress so far. But let's, let's dig into market. So – for those who are unfamiliar, how large is the market? And, and I know there's several segments of the market, but even if you just want to focus on orbital debris or if you want to you know, expand upon- Let's uh, focus on the market. Counter- yep, yeah, go and ahead. I, you know, because I jump around, I've, I've really covered, I touch on everything. So I'm gonna, I can go through it quicker as we go. It'll accelerate because I'm touching everything because I'm going. So market, uh, I think 2019, the global space economy was 420 billion. The U.S. space economy in 2019, I've been quoted by the Department of Commerce, by the founding member, of the director of the space office of the Department of Commerce, was about $330 billion. So you could tell the U.S. was overwhelmingly uh, the, the large uh, share of that. So they forecast that in five years, we'll be at a trillion. <clears throat> and we were one of, I think, four or five featured companies. Say what you want. No politics here. But... In the Trump administration, Wilbur Ross was the uh, Secretary of Commerce responsible for a 4.4 trillion budget. He invited our company as one of four at one of his panels at the Economic Library, the Department of Commerce, for a few hundred people, you know, like high up in all the intelligence community and C-level executives from from uh, defense contractors and uh, very high up in government. And Marshall was one of the panelists on space risks and threats. And uh, I could have gone, but I didn't want to do it, but there were four people invited to have breakfast with the Secretary of Commerce. So I feel very confident about at least the numbers that they've told us, because I've been in the meetings and we've had White House meetings. I feel comfortable with the market size is very big. And uh, they think in five years, a trillion. At 10 years, they're not sure, they're just saying two to three trillion. So it's, it's not a tiny market. I'm not saying that we have, you know, there's. There's a segmented available market and penetrated available market and total available market. What we're claiming is we're here to provide space flight safety for that one trillion and growing market through what we're doing. And the, the biggest threat we believe is orbital debris and space traffic management. And there's the, the, the economic threat isn't as big to the military piece, although those satellites could be a billion or more, but the threat of attack is pretty high if they're taken out. So that's the market size and it's big. And yeah. everybody knows you're gonna to have to spend billions of dollars to clean up orbital debris. What's the smartest way to do it? We think we're the smartest way to do it. That's great. No, that's great. And I know you also, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Eric, uh, let me interject something. This, this problem has to be solved. It's not, it's not an option. We don't solve it, we could lose access to space altogether, killing a trillion dollar business a year. So this is pretty important stuff. And um, I think you have to realize that what we're doing is we're, prov- we're gonna provide a service for every satellite operator that they can't get right now. And that service is keeping their spacecraft safe from the debris. That's one of our main uh, revenue uh, streams. Uh, secondly, we'll have uh, national security contracts, I'm sure to help the Space Force. And there's a lot of- We other- believe we will have, never sure. Yeah, thank well, you. yeah. I-, I know, but the net capital is beating that into us. So thank you. Do appreciate that. Thanks. Go ahead, Marshall. <laughs> yeah, well, we've already we've already had a contract from the Space Force, uh, uh, the geostationary problems, and we, we resolved those as, as John mentioned. But uh, many, much of our revenue streams will be under subscription because we're gonna we're gonna provide a service, an ongoing service to satellite operators, constellation operators, to keep their 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 space path, so to speak, clear of debris, so that they can be safely flown. And this must be done. Did you want to uh, get into business model or? 
I'm trying to accelerate now for, for both our sakes. Yeah. Or did you have yeah. something to say, Eric? No, no, that's great. I was, so I think that's great. Yeah, let's, let's continue along with business model. Um, I'd also like to circle back since I know you guys have substantial intellectual property. So I'd love to get into defensibility and IP after that, but feel free. All right, well, that's easy. There's four, there are four patents okay. and there's a ton of trade secrets. Marshall's, look him up. He has defended a lot of companies for expert witness in their legal cases. And he's won I shouldn't let, he represented one company and they got a hundred million dollar win. And, and the one that lost came back to him in the, after that at some point to represent him. So um, you got to trade off what's going to be a patent, what's going to be a trade secret. And I don't care how good your patent is. It does a lot for you, but sometimes you want to keep things as a trade secret because you don't want to provide a roadmap for someone to try to be a fast follower. So it's a combination of, um, patents and trade secrets, but there are four patents. And the, the critical one, which we were happy we got, we did it on an expedited, we pay an extra fee for that, was um, because everything in low earth orbit, it's approximate. The, the higher you are, the longer it takes to orbit. The lower you are, it, it, it goes faster. It's faster, but it, about at the typical altitudes that the satellites would be, it's about 50 minutes to do one orbit. And, uh, um, um, I, that's wrong. It's an hour and a half, but the orbit of debris is crossing the equator once every 50 minutes, approximately. And um, we're just going to line up the orbit of debris pads where we, it, it, that, that is at the altitude and at the equator. So when the debris crosses the equator, it's sort of past collection. It comes to us and hits the pad and it's the small stuff. So that's sort of the elegance to Marshall's idea. Instead of chasing stuff and spending billions of dollars, you put these very, very large pads up there because just orbital mechanics, everything in low Earth orbit has to cross the equator. It's like, did you have basic math? The only lines that don't cross are parallel lines. But so John, a parallel uh, line, John, don't. Marshall, we're on short of time. I know, it won't take long. Um, yeah, go ahead. understand that orbital mechanics tells us that everything crosses the equator every 50 minutes. So everything in low Earth orbit across including satellites, debris, and everything every 50 minutes. Our solution is in the equator. It's over the equator. So we've, we've reduced a three-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional problem. And, that, and that, that saves us billions of dollars right there. And Love that. No, that's great addition. So, so the patent ahead. is to protect actually orbital debris remediation operations in the equator. And that's not specified, even though there isn't so much in GEO. It, we have two patents. It's really for near Earth orbits and, and geosynchronous Earth orbits. So if someone wants to try to do debris clearing in any fashion in the equator, that's infringing on our patent. That was important to have as a patent. How we're specifically going to capture debris with the pads and not create splatter, I don't think I want to have that. Um, I, I don't want that roadmap for the world. So that stays a trade secret as an Perfect. example. Okay. No, thanks for that on defensibility. That that was really helpful. And I think it came together well. And I think we're actually- It's just because you're a lawyer with a degree from Michigan. You wanted to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to hear it. I think IP is a critically important part of something so technologically advanced Thank like you. this. I, I do. Um, so one more question came in that I want to get to, but just because so everybody's on the same path here, I think we are, are on track for time. We'll circle back to competitive landscape um, after this question. And then we could probably start wrapping up with closing remarks, which will be, you know, why is now the perfect time uh, to, to go to that. Well, let me one thing. If you okay. go to my deck, you want business model. There's two slides. One is financials orbital debris and the other is financial sensor satellites. And, uh, if you could put that in the, uh, chat, Eric, that would be slides number. Let me just see slides 11 and 12 will answer the business model question that you have for me. If you look at that, it's basically just talking about what the profit margins are and what we expect to be putting up in terms of numbers of spacecraft and when. Uh, Net capital would have a heart attack if I start saying we, we hope we can grow to X millions or X billions. So I simply lay out our plans, what each thing costs. This is not pipe dream stuff. Um, you know, the, 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 the ISS project, I have it locked down to the, Within, within hundreds, or I wouldn't have gotten the grant. So those two slides are gonna go through the business model if we're gonna jump off those questions. Slides uh, 
um, 11 and 12. Okay. Yep. And, and, and uh, any, yep. And of course, uh, I want to encourage all of the participants to get, you go to the offering page. There's more information there <laughs> and the pitch deck is available on the offering page as always. So do feel free to revisit that information um, after the webinar. Uh, so getting into this question that came in and, and again, yeah. please do continue to ask your questions. We want to keep this interactive. Uh, so who are your potential customers, uh, John Marshall? Uh, I'll go first and he'll, he'll fill in my capability gaps. I'm, it's, it's, I'm being funny. That's what the military calls it. So NASA, clearly. Airbus, clearly. Uh, someone's going to ask about IPO or exit. You, you would hope that acquisitions in that. And so far, Airbus has been a phenomenal partner. Um, I can't say they're going to acquire us, but uh, if they did, I would, I, you know, at least there's someone that I would trust and we can work with closely. And they've got a better legacy for orbital debris, you know, uh, doing work for orbital debris than anybody, anybody by far. It's, it's unfortunate that, you know, Europe started this, but you know, this is now Airbus US defense in space. So, um, um, so NASA, you know, there's a lot of tiers. Space Command is part of the Space Force, but they're the ones that set the requirements for it doesn't matter. Oh, I've got a great idea. I've got a great idea. It doesn't matter. They need to create a requirement for it. And it's quite a long haul, quite requires lobbyists and persistence and great ideas and great team and credibility to get someone to want to put something in requirements. And uh, if you're really good, they don't bid it out. There's, there's reasons it's so sourced Do you do a demonstrator so that now you've got that and that can expand to a huge contract that doesn't get put out to anybody else if it's your idea and it started as a demonstrator. So NASA, you call it the Space Force, Space Command sets requirements, but they have a small budget. Space Force really has the budget. Um, you look at space traffic management, some will be Department of Commerce, they're gonna have a budget for data. Um, you're looking at the FAA doing some of that. You're gonna look at NOAA has some budget, the National Oceanographic, uh, you know, that does the weather. They're interested in that. So from the government, you're looking at NASA, Space Force, and to a lesser uh, Department of Commerce, and to a lesser extent, no, and the FAA. I don't know if the FAA is ever going to have budget for it, but they might have uh, some oversight. Uh, and then commercial customers are going to, you know, the, the Iridium is, is sort of the, the one the most ahead. We know, know the big guy at Iridium who would be doing this, but I feel that the commercial customers are on the tail end of, of some of this work, because if you go to a roadmap slide of, uh, can you go to slide six? If you go to slide six, Absolutely. it just it encapsulates everything. I think it's beautiful. And again, it's online. <clears throat> you, when you put that up, I'll explain that in a, in a snapshot. We're at the top right now, Airbus, Bartolomeo platform. That's what's going up. That's a snapshot of their, their uh, being put on the outside of the space station, they call it in the ram direction, the forward facing direction, which is where the debris is gonna smack into. What's on the right is sort of a very simple representation of a multi-layer orbital debris remediation pad. That's what's being put up there with sensors. So we can see the orbital debris hits where it happens in orbit. What's the velocity impact, how deep it went, a lot of factors. The middle step is a small version of an orbital debris pad that's real. It's gonna fly in some of the congested orbits. Uh, gave a representation of what that would look like if we put it on a Falcon 9 and their payload fairing. And then the final version down below is uh, the, 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 they call it the full operational uh, uh, orbital debris uh, pad. I don't see the commercial customers really coming in until at least the middle step. And it's, it could be the insurance companies that push them and say, I'm not gonna insure you because of the increased risks. Definitely by the last step, I'm not going to build it and, and build and they will come. I, you, you give me a contract and pay me and I will go. But that said, the commercial customers will, will ultimately be the biggest market. If you look at GPS satellites and communication satellites and low earth orbit, you know, look at Elon Musk uh, and all his, he's trying to put himself up 42,000 satellites. They'll be the biggest market, but they're never the first ones to want to stick their toe in the water. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can go no, more. I, and no, then the slide no, again, slide those two slides on financials will cover sort of what we expect to get paid for these things. Okay. Perfect. 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 And All the right. last couple of questions that came in here, let's see if we can get to them both. 
uh, and I was like, you get this uh, main competitor. So what does the competitive landscape look like and how do you differentiate yourself? Mm -hmm. the, there is a competitor slide, but the real simple nutshell, because it wasn't part of your questions, you're trying to throw me zingers. You said you're going to, you, you look at every question that comes in and I'll know. And you just, you didn't, you know, you didn't do that. You just threw it, but that's fine. We should know our competitors. Um, there's, there's a list of a lot of companies that have proposed solutions. I think some are fantasy, some are proposed, some are on orbit, but everybody's really trying to, from what we see, solve the big orbital debris problem. They want to lasso stuff. Yeehaw, like I'm from Texas. They want to harpoon it, going for the whale in Japan. And they want to uh, put a net over it. They want to use something to use natural forces, margin constraint to, to naturally deorbit it. That actually seems like that could work for big stuff. But that, that plane change, getting to these pieces of debris, it's not like Star Trek. It takes so much propulsion to get there. It, just to pull 30,000 pieces of debris would cost tens of billions of dollars. So everyone's focused on the big debris problem when there's, from, from big down to the smallest piece, probably tens of trillions of pieces of debris, but the stuff that's dangerous that can't be seen is, is probably about a trillion pieces. It's, it's crazy. So we're looking at the small debris problem for remediation, but we're gonna track everything. That's why the sensors are in space, big and small, down to a level that's smaller than being done now. So I would differentiate us as the only comprehensive solution, sensors to see, pads to remediate, and really the only one focused on small debris, and we've got the patents to back that up. Every competitor is after big debris. So they're actually, I wouldn't call them competitors. I would say it's complementary. There are problematic pieces of big debris that's gotta be cleared, all right? It's too bad I don't, I, I'd show you on my, go to my video and queue it up to a minute and 20 seconds. If not today, guys, go to a minute and if you're, in, if you're bored by the slow pace for the first minute and 20, I'm setting up the, the, what we are in the threats. At a minute and 20, I use my sense of humor and I play this cute little Mozart music that's really la la la. And it shows the space station after China tested a, an anti-satellite weapon, blew up a satellite, the debris went around the earth and you see the space station flying and just barely missing this debris as Mozart strums away. It's like high blood pressure, the hidden threat that'll kill you, but you don't know it's there. And then after that, I show another, the iridium collision playing to Mozart music and all that happens there. And then we go into the sensor problem of all the places our enemies can hide and how they can sneak up. So from about a minute and 20 to about five or six minutes, that's where the action is. And then we go to what you see here, the team, our milestones with NASA and the Space Force, commercial customers, and what we plan on doing. And, and so if you, if you want a snapshot and see it visually, this is not an, you know, like made up animations. We use software that's designed for satellite missions. So it's actually not some artist rendition stuff. It, it, it's graphics that, that are generated from software, from analytical graphics. It's their systems toolkit. It used to be called satellite toolkit. It's actually what things look like. The moon and the sun lined up. They're the right size and right distance. All the problems from a minute and 20 to about six minutes. Go, go click on the video. All right. Perfect. Yeah. And, and there are a couple of questions that came in here, but, but since we have our last minute here and, and I alluded to this, let's just end with the closing remarks here. And I think John and Marshall, you spoke to this, but why is now the perfect time for the, the, the participants here uh, to go to netcapital.com and invest in LaunchBase? Um, look, I've been chasing for almost, it's, it's almost like two companies. Marshall's been looking at the orbital debris problem before anybody. And I was enamored by the sensor problem. So we, we, we obviously do everything, but I've been chasing a deal for almost three years from our, our Air Force Research Lab uh, funded study on threats and how to solve it. And we're trying to acquire a sensor from the government, the first one, at no cost. I mean, there, there's other costs, but I mean the sensor itself to go do one of these missions. That value we're estimating at $54 million. It's, it's hard to be exact. So I don't own it, we don't own it, but if you're given a sensor for that amount, and then there's, it's, it's probably a $100 million mission on top of that. What do you think the value of our company is? So that's been my baby for almost three years. 
And the kind of deals we're chasing, it's like a step function. If you get one of these deals, then, then I think the value of our company would go way, way up. And um, it's a good time now because uh, I've seen some of the things on, on the Net Capital Portal, and I don't want to get shot by Eric, but I think based on our milestones and our comparables and what other companies have posted, we're very reasonably priced. Um, no, I think, and, I'm, going, and I think I'm going to. You will click. I'll, so, with that kind of, those kind of deals, you won't see that. And um, I hope with these, these press releases and articles that expect to be coming out to be sold out pretty quickly on this round. And that's another reason to get in now because it, I think we'll always be a great deal because we're gonna be growing. But if you wanna get in at this price, this would be a good time. I think that's a perfect way to bring us home here. I'm gonna go ahead and add a link to the offer page one more time. Of course, as we mentioned, Launch Space is actively raising capital on the Net Capital platform. Um, I also want to thank all of our attendees for coming in, the participants for asking your questions. It was very thoughtful, and I appreciate it. I always love hanging out with you, John and Marshall. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us about Launch Space. And of course, as always, this has been recorded and will be uploaded to the Net Capital YouTube account. I'm going to go ahead and add a link to that into the chat right here. So if you missed any of it, or if you want to share with someone who you think might be interested in learning more about Launch Space and potentially investing, please do share generally. Um, so again, thanks for, for joining in and asking your questions. Uh, John and Marshall, always a pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank thanks, everybody. Bye and uh, put questions on the discussion portal if I miss something. It's another way. I did, yeah. So for those of you who asked questions that we couldn't get to, I did encourage you to go to the offering page to ask those questions. Uh, so please do do that. We want to keep, uh, keep you guys engaged. Thank you thanks very much. Thanks for the reminder, John. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Thanks. Thank you.